Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining today. My name is Mark Imhoff, Head of Security and Enterprise Architecture at System Soft Technologies. We are looking forward to a, an insightful and engaging episode on financial cybersecurity vulnerabilities and what you need to know. On behalf of System Soft Technologies and Security Compliance Associates, thank you for taking time to join us today. We would like to ensure an engaging experience, so please submit your questions at, at uh, any time by, by posting them in the comments section. Uh, now let's uh, introduce our panel today, our panel of experts. We have James Patterson, Senior Vice President, Financial Vertical Leader at SystemSoft Technologies. Afternoon, James. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, like Mark said, uh, we run the financial vertical as well as the digital design practice for system soft technologies based in Florida. Thank you, uh, James. Uh, we also have Ali Hamachi, a uh, cybersecurity architect at system soft technologies. Afternoon, Ali. Hello, everyone. And uh, thanks, Mark, for inviting me today. And then we have special guest, uh, uh, Colas Dunwoody, uh, ethical hacker at Security Compliance Associates. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, like Mark said, my name is Colas Dunwoody, and I'm an ethical hacker here at Sec Security Compliance Associates. And my job is to assess the overall security posture of an in organization's internal and external network. Thanks, Colas. Uh, welcome everybody who has tuned in. We look forward to an engaging uh, engaging with you today. So let's get started. Uh, ransomware is the top uh, cyber threat to small banks and credit unions with 90% of all financial institutions having experienced ransomware in the past year. With the uh, ever-changing work environment and remote work, security vulnerabilities are at all time high. With that said, you know, we got about five topics we're going to try to cover today, if we can get to all of them within 30 minutes. But uh, let's start off. We're going to start off talking about open banking and screen scraping. So, James, can you uh, talk to us about from uh, the business vertical of financial industry uh, about uh, your concerns on open banking and screen scraping? Yeah, so much of you from the financial services perspective have seen over the last 36 months um, customers demanding to have their data ported to where they live, you know, their app managed applications of choice, and that's caused open banking to have to be forced to take on new protocols. But also you have a contrasting view and kind of how people are plugging into that from the aggregators who are actually not using tokenization and screen scraping credentials of your top customers. And so that healthy balance of saying, you know, we might not be able to have our legacy pl plug directly into a tokenization server, but you're still empowering your your aggregators. There's five main of them that are screen scraping, you know, at 2 a.m., which you're probably seeing that on your load balancers and wondering what that is. So we'll take some time from the solution architecture, a business side, and then call us to be able to say what the, the inroads is, inroads are to lower that risk profile of the overall uh, risk assessment of, of tokenization. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, Colas, from a ethical hacker standpoint, what are you looking for when it comes to open banking and screen scraping from a vulnerability standpoint? Yeah, so open banking, open banking, we're pretty much checking the application's functionality to see what kind of controls they have in place, you know, that, that are to prevent hackers from performing unwanted actions. For example, we may create an account and see if we can transfer money that's not there or we may create two two accounts and try to use the same accounting router number. So um, that's pretty much we test for open banking when it comes to screen scraping. You know, an attacker can screen scrape a banker's application login page to create a fake website, you know, that mimics the legitimate banking application. Um, they can tie that with phishing by sending out an alerting email warning all users to confirm their bank account numbers you know, and then they'll bed a malicious leak inside. Once a user clicks on that link, it takes them to a web page that looks exactly like the legitimate bank's login page. Once the user enters their credentials and hits login, they're reverted to the actual login page, you know, not knowing that they just handed over their credentials. 
So, you know, this same scenario can go for a company's employee portal login. So those are some of the things we uh, check out. Awesome, uh, Carlos. Uh, Ali, from an architect and consulting standpoint, we have, we have you know, people trying to do malicious things, you know, and trying to find vulnerabilities. What, what can we recommend as some rules of thumb to uh, our audience here from a from a open banking and screen scraping standpoint? Well, to uh, call us in James's point, uh, and if I wanted to elaborate to a little bit uh, further on the risks with the screen scraping. Uh, so the big risk that we see is that uh, credentials must be stored on an encrypted format, or at the very least at the uh, on a clear format to the, to the server doing the scraping, which should present a big risk for those credentials being leaked. Another problem is that screen scraping doesn't allow users to control the scope or put a time limit to sharing credentials. Basically, the only way of uh, stopping that is uh, by changing those passwords. Uh, uh, we're talking about the customers losing controls over their data, their credentials. No consent is required, no regulations are enforced, in opposite to open banking, where accredited uh, data recipients are all allowed to uh, process customers' data. Plus, uh, we can talk about open banking not requiring uh, password sharing, uh, sharing at all. So if I want to talk about uh, how can we contribute or who are the stakeholders that can contribute to mitigating those risks, so I can list uh, three, at least three, three levels. At the bank level or financial institution, uh, banks should really enhance uh, uh, awareness training programs for, for, for their customers. Uh, on risk associated with uh, screen scraping. Um, uh, they should also offer and collaborate with trusted, secure third parties and uh, have their customers collaborate with those uh, third parties. On, um, on the regulatory side, authorities should regulate technical standards and strong authentication requirements for banks, as well as mandate secure communication channels uh, that banks must implement. Um, on the customer side, on, online users should really understand that uh, protecting their credentials and their data is their responsibility. It's, a, it's something that they could never transfer to someone else. They need to be security, security aware, uh, use trusted platforms, and if needed, consult with their financial institutions if they're unsure. Thanks, so. I like to add a couple things to that, which is, one is, Security is not just the corporation responsibility, but the individual. And uh, something we've talked about in the past is, uh, you know, you're as strong as you're as weak and weak. And then in most cases, you know, you know, from when, it come, when it comes from security, uh, social engineering and individuals doing some of the phishing stuff, clicking on links is some of the, one of the highest things that we see in the sense of, security breach. So individual responsibility is just as important as the corporate building, you know, compliances, have GRC, all these other, you know, security components to it, and which really hits on our theme of compliance isn't security and, and that uh, compliance is a great way to do a checklist, but there's way more to it than that, right? And we will make sure we get that across. So with that said, I'd like to move to our next topic, which is distributed and remote work for, uh, workplace. So James, if he could talk about uh, what your concerns are in this area, and then we can see if Collis and Ali can uh, educate our audience on uh, how we get some rules and thumbs to, to help uh, prevent that. Yeah, with a, a new generation of leaders coming into the workforce, you know, this distributive um, team dynamic has been introduced well before COVID or the pandemic. And it, it just simply got exacerbated over the last 20 months as we've had to find service providers and application providers to allow us to collaborate dynamically in real time. And so what you've done, you started to open up your solution architecture and your tech stack to like Microsoft Teams and Slack and Salesforce chat, you know, Confluence and Jura have always been there, but now you have a load of a lot of people on it. And then also the client facing applications like DocuSign and Adobe Sign, you know, you're really only as good as your weakest application provider. So how do you keep that alignment of the integrity of the tech stack in line with the needs of the team being distributed around the, work, the world? And so we'll take a second to, to touch on that project as well. 
All right, thanks. So call us again from your standpoint. Can you kind of talk to the audience about, uh, you know, some things that you're looking for from a vulnerability standpoint and distributed and remote workforce, workplace? Yeah. So uh, while conducting, you know, several pen tests, I've noticed an increased usage of VPNs. You know, they're, they're extremely useful, especially at a time like this. From a company's perspective, the resources available within their private network can be accessed remotely. Um, so the stress of worrying about COVID cases in the workplace is reduced. However, many of these are not up to date with the latest protocols and security practice, or they contain bugs. Many of these applications or devices use compact with robust tools to ensure an organization's needs are met, but are completely bare. And it's up to the IT department to configure and bring it to a secure state. While testing these sorts of applications, I've come across many security weaknesses uh, that an adversary can exploit, such as misconfigurations within the HTTP headers. Uh, so the application is vulnerable to click jacking attacks pretty much which means an adversary can embed, embed a malicious link within the application to trick a user into performing unwanted actions. Cross-site scripting is another one. So retrieving that user's session cookie to conduct a cross-site request forgery attack is also possible. Some of the more severe cases I've encountered, it's not validating user input. So I'm able to execute OS commands on the server that's running the application and retrieve sensitive data or perform other unwanted actions. You know, the list goes on. I think it's vital to ensure that companies have the right personnel to secure and deploy such applications or devices. And it's also important to have them tested, you know, and as a result, organizations' defense systems are strengthening along with those who operate in that environment. Awesome calls. So I'll again, one more time, I mean, you know, as our kind of architect and consultant from security and protection stand, building a good security posture, can you give some uh, recommendations to, to uh, that directly align to what uh, Carlos was talking about? Are you some good rules of thumb around distributed remote workplace? Yeah, so uh, one of the biggest points we look for when we perform uh, uh, such analysis is that uh, uh, controls that have been implemented are they default vendor uh, uh, default vendor configured, and it's uh, usually the case. So um, and that's you know to Colin's point is is very exploitable. Um, this brings us to you know today's topic, which is uh, compliance is not necessarily security, meaning, um, yes, you are compliant, you've implemented a control, um, I can bring up VPN, uh, for instance, however, how strong and how adaptive to, to today's uh, threats um, are these controls that you've implemented. It is important also for organizations to perform uh, an external and internal risk analysis specific to collaborative applications and uh, specific to data sharing. So I can I could mention um, uh, data protection uh, programs such as DLP, data classification and whatnot. So um, these risk analysis should be, you know, uh, performed at the uh, B2E level, B2B and B2C if we're communicating directly with customers. Uh, a full remediation plan or treatment plan should be established to mitigate uh, those risks. Uh, it is very important for us to uh, understand what threats related uh, to uh, our industry are out there and how vulnerable are we to those threats. Thanks, Ali. We do have a, a question from the audience uh, that I would like to before we go to our next subject, really, and that is how do how do I know if my system has been hacked? Carlos, Ali, uh, Ali? Yeah, so I'll speak a little bit about that. So pretty much you would want to look for IOCs, which is indicators of compromise. And some of those are, you know, unusual outbound network traffic, um, unusual DNS requests, uh, signs of DDoS activity, unexpected patching of systems, um, unexpected open ports, things of that sort. 
Okay. Thanks, I Carlos. Could, I could add to that the fact that um, you know it is very important to to implement some sort of a, a security operation center, uh, whether through a SIM or through other tools uh, that are out there. Um, sim, it is very important those sims to be uh, kind of a next generation sims uh, with user behavior analysis, uh, uh, in, intelligent correlation to to the uh, you know uh, correlation of those events. So this per, uh, practically uh, uh, you know um, make us understand you know what kind of uh, uh, events are happening and how can we correlate to something abnormal that's uh, happening on our system. Yeah, I, I think you hit the head on the one I wanted to mention was the event correlation because there is so many different opportunities for attack, right? That, that you got to correlate those. That, that really helps understand who's trying to be malicious within your environment. So with that said, I'd like to move on to our next uh, topic, which is proactive intelligence and monitoring. Uh, this is... I think this is something big, kind of goes with our other subject, which is more like board awareness and executive awareness. But uh, James, can you go ahead and talk about uh, protective intelligence monitoring, how that would help you as like an SVP within the financial industry? Yeah, like Hollis alluded to, you know, there's definitely tactical things you can do, but it's funny in capital markets, we think in data in real time, you know, we're processing in nanoseconds, but for other areas of the financial institutions, we're not necessarily doing that. And so the, the proactive intelligence comes from the real time threat monitoring and, you know, call us and ourselves can help you configure what that looks like. And what you are, you're adding that risk analysis to a living and breathing ecosystem. It's always changing. There's hands in the cookie jar. You know, it's this different hosts between cloud and redundancy as well as physical and private cloud. And so you have a lot of pulling forces there. But the main thing is getting retrospectives because when these events occur in the wild or in the public domain, not many people share what those retrospects look like, nor do they publish how the outcomes were. You never know how quite, um, you know, the, the, the business themselves were able to either shift and lift their posture, or if it's simply just swept under the rug. And so that kind of sharing of the experience is a big push for this as well. And so we work with hundreds of thousands of companies and have a great um, insight into their perspectives. Thanks, James. So I'm going to shake it up a little bit and go to Ollie this time and talk about, uh, especially from a security posture and, uh, you know, from a holistic view from a, uh, I call it the security ecosystem personally, but from a, from a, so, some of the rules of thumb when you're thinking about pro uh, proactive intelligence and monitoring. Yeah, so I'd like to bring up uh, some, uh, something very popular right now, which is the threat intelligence dashboards. Uh, many solutions, or even if we bring up the same uh, environment, uh, most likely you find them uh, hooked up to some sort of a, a threat intelligence uh, real life. Uh, so, um, or we call them cyber threat intelligence. Uh, these are dashboards an organization used to understand the threat that, that have or will or currently targeting organizations, whether uh, sector specific or industry specific or uh, geolocation. This info is used uh, to prepare and prevent and identify cyber threats. So when you implement those, uh, those type of um, uh, dashboards or those, those type of tools, they're normally connected to you know a, a real life experts and or real life database that is being fed uh, and analyzed uh, there we can list a couple of popular uh, threat intelligence uh, the dashboards but uh, you know when you have them uh, you making sure that you're proactive you understand you know the uh, cyber security uh, ecosystem as you mentioned and of course, uh, you definitely uh, want to know how um, how vulnerable are you and have you been attacked, basically. Uh, so this is a very key information uh, that you want to have real life. Carlos, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, well, I can speak as, you know, from an attacker's perspective, 
the techniques I would use to try to avoid detection. So um, some of the techniques are obfuscation, which distorts the program while keeping its form, or I could just use encryption, which effectively, effectively eliminates the ability for antivirus to detect, you know, malware through the signature alone. So I like that you're using encryption, which a lot of organizations use today to stop people from getting data, but you're using it against the, the, the user themselves in a sense to protect yourself. That's, that's very interesting. I like that. Um, I, let's, let's, let's move on. I mean, we got a little time left, so I'd like to talk about the executive committee and board awareness. So James, can we talk about the importance of that for an, an organization? Yeah, I mean, most of you probably have now a CISO um, who sits on the executive committee of which three to four years ago, it didn't even exist as a functional role or leadership role, but also your board of governors, your board of directors, you know, it's, it's just a new thing to think about. And it actually has nothing to do with the operating of a business per se. It's more of a tax, but you have to protect, you know, proactively this and you have to spend money and carve money out. Um, and the board really has to take the leadership to understand like this is one of the largest risks to your business cycle, right? It's not your supply chain. It's not your margin. It's not your customer attrition. It's your security posture and how that's in line with your market vertical, your customers needs and your collaboration of your teams across the board. Great. So how do we, how do we uh, as security architects, consultants, how do we help organizations or what are your thoughts on, on moving security up the chain so we get full buy-in from the whole organization? Sometimes that's some of the biggest issues is not getting that, that buy-in. Yeah, so uh, there's this two ways. So normally um, um, there, there's the governance side or there's the, um, uh, you know, the, the risk uh, side of things, which is normally driven by, by the global enterprise uh, objective or business strategic objective. So uh, normally there is a, a, a lot of uh, activity that's cascaded down uh, to the uh, information security uh, objectives or plan. Um, what do we do at uh, Systemsoft? Uh, you know, usually uh, when we look at our client's uh, security posture or architecture, is no, uh, is provide um, an executive summary that it gives you an overall uh, security posture with basically. Uh, uh, grading uh, and uh, test your um, test your vulnerability and give you how how mature is what you've implemented as as controls. Uh, yeah, so that um, executive summary would help uh, uh, you know the board understand you know where are they from uh, from an eco uh, ecosystem. And you know, help them um, build a, a roadmap. Uh, and here, where we come is that you know we we provide the remediation plan uh, with some sort of quick wins and some sort of strategic planning uh, based on um, uh, your organization's objectives. Now, I, I would agree to that, but I would also like to add that you know part of that is showcasing what's going on in the marketplace today, right? I mean, that's a, that's a great way to showcase, you know, especially ransomware and some of the things that's going on lately with uh, data, um, uh, the stealing of data and putting it out on the dark web, which I'm going to, uh, we, thought we have actually a blog that we just got put out, our white paper about that, about the dark web and getting your information out there. So I'd suggest people go read it, but just uh a shameless plug there but with that said you know that is key right you know your product or your brand is very important to you as an organization and that from a board awareness and uh an executive committee standpoint so to me those are some key things that you don't want to be the next one in front of new york times right no. <laughs> i mean to me that's a that's a great way to kickstart that type of conversation with them um 
Well, we what we have, we have like five minutes left. Uh, I, I re, I, I'd like to really hit one subject real quick before we go to questions, which is uh, next generation security for the financial industry, really. Or, I mean, if, if we could just put like real, like 30 seconds, if you could, Ali or call us, either one or both of you, on, on where do you see security in 2022, 2023, in the sense of both from a vulnerability standpoint maybe potentially i know you know hackers are continuously trying to figure ways out to find cracks in the in the armor uh or from a security posture standpoint ollie yeah so i could uh, elaborate a little bit so i i, I would see a lot of um, integration of uh, machine learning and uh, business intelligence into uh, security i mentioned uh, threat uh, threat intelligence dashboards and um, um, continuous uh, monitoring or continuous, uh, we can say continuous compliance, continuous GRC is something trendy now. So everybody's, uh, we used to talk about point in time, scan, point in time, or um, insight. Uh, there's no such a point uh, anymore. So I see more of a continuous uh, kind of uh, overlooking your security posture. This is going to be a must. Um, well, we're getting down to the time, so uh, I would think I like to thank uh, uh, thank you, the the panel here, James, Ollie, Collis, for our great insight and ob observation in this short, you know, thirty minutes. There's a lot of the kind of subject areas we tried to cover in a very short amount of time. And try to get as in depth as we could with the limited amount of time we had. I'd like to open it up to see if you have any questions for our audience. Uh, one of the first questions is how often should we uh, should you do testing? Ollie? Yeah, so uh, it brings to the to the previous point uh, brings me to um, uh, talking a little bit about uh, the fact that internal internal assessment or internal audit should be continuous, should be real, real time. Uh, there's enough tools now to, to, you know, to provide you with, uh, with that information. Now from an external auditing, um, I know banks and financial institutions are, uh, are mandated to perform uh, some sort of a compliance on a yearly basis, but from a vulnerability pen testing scanning, this is really something that you should at least perform twice a year. Uh, that's recommended. Carlos, do you have any insight or? Yeah, so um, just like Ali said, it should be conducted you know, on a routine basis, but I also wanna miss, mention that you wanna make sure you give yourself you know, enough time to implement those mitigations. You don't just wanna be conducting these pen tests and then it keeps spitting out the same vulnerabilities over and over. Mm -hmm. So you wanna give yourself enough time to mitigate and then come back to test. Right. I, I would add one other thing is, yeah, you should, I mean, most organizations should do continuous part of their overall security posture monitoring, but uh, I highly recommend, I think a lot of uh, organizations recommend that, you know, you should use third party in a sense to get a, a unbiased view of your environment and, you know, and some use tools, some use manual. Here at SS Tech, we tend to use more both manual and, and products, so we get a better view of your overall security posture. But again, I would say using third party uh, on a periodic basis is also to, to validate what your security team's been doing. Um, so with that said, uh, that's all the time we have today. If we didn't get to one of your questions you submitted we'll reach out to you directly with an answer we'd like to thank everyone for joining us live today we ha we hope you found this session helpful and insightful and look forward to connecting with you again soon so thank you again panel and thank you for people who's able to join us live thank Until you next time. yep thank you